and you want to very, very specifically seek it. So if you do a very slow injection and talk to the patient, are you feeling okay? Have you got any tingling in your lips? Do you feel strange or funny? Um, it gives you a chance to avoid having a big, a big intravascular injection. Anyone seen an intravascular injection of pivocaine? Anybody else? Have you had one, Anand? I've, I've had a spectacular one in an awake patient doing a sciatic block. Just, I did it slowly, we asked five times, you okay, you're right, fine, fine. The plunger hit the stop as the last mill went in, and the patient said, I feel really funny now, and immediately started fitting. Um, it was kind of, okay, propofol sucks tube, um, take, it from, take it from here. Okay. Do you know what pressure paresthesia is? Have you come across it? It's, a, it's tedious. Have you come across it when you're doing blocking around the root of the neck? Everyone tells you when you're doing awake injections, particularly you know, in the root of the neck, that you're asking people to report painful sensations. And if you say to people, you know, are you feeling pain, how are you feeling? A lot of them will describe a dull ache that's normal. As the local anaesthetic is going into the space, it puts pressure on the nerves and it creates this sensation of a dull ache, which is totally different from the pain of an intraneural injection, which is lancinating, severe, horrible, terrible pain that, you know, it's like knitting needles being shoved up and down your arm. So some patients are really good at, at giving a history of, about what's going on. Others are really difficult. Well, it's a bit sore. You know. And I actually said to me, is, it, is this a sharp shooting pain down your arm like a knitting needle being shoved up your arm? Or is it a dull ache? And they might say, okay, it's this one or it's that one. Um, but I've seen a few people stop doing injections I think were okay because the patient reported, the patient reported a dull ache. Um, you don't want to get any response from the patient whether they're awake or asleep. If you're doing blocks in patients who are asleep, they can still let you know they're in pain. Um, do they still, I don't do much correct, do they still do anal stretches? Do you still anesthetize people for anal stretches? Do they stop doing that? Okay. They, they, they used to do a four finger anal stretch if people had a bit of um, constriction of their anal sphincter. And basically that was a GA, up, feet up in lithotomy position, four fingers in, huge stretch, unbelievably stimulating. Um, and there was a large succession of patients who s fell off the table, put their legs around the surgeon's neck, you know, got the ring spasm, jumped up and down. It was actually quite difficult to anaesthetise a patient for that because it was one of those surgeries that's fairly quick, asleep, go. Um, and those patients, although they were asleep, with that level of stimulation, they sure let you know about it. And I think the same applies to patients asleep and having blocks. If you do injection slowly, if they look like they're feeling something, if they suddenly start breathing twice as fast, or they get um, inspiratory stridal, or they make purposeful movements, you know, lo 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 locating type movements, then assume your intraneural will stop. And if, don't do any more in the block. Just, uh, just quit. So that's your kind of checklist to do your block to get one that's reasonably effective without causing any damage. Um, I haven't done it yet. I know my turn's coming, okay? I'm not proud about this. My turn will come. There, there will come a day when this happens. Um, probably less important now with ultrasound. But you now I've been theatre more than half a dozen times to try and help someone with a block that wasn't working. And the first thing I've seen is an empty atricurium syringe, okay? Um, if you put the atricurium in today before you've done your block, just, you know, say, I wasn't going to use an instrumental just give me the ultrasound machine. I'll do it with the ultrasound machine. Okay, so those are two questions. How do I get a good block and how do I avoid nerve damage? And if we look at the physiology of nerve stimulation, when you put your needle in with the nerve stimulator going, you've got a certain amount of energy <coughs> that's at a certain distance from the nerve and the needle's got a certain polarity. Um, you don't have to choose the polarity of the needle now. It's important. What you want is a negative needle. If you're ever given a machine that allows you to choose it, make sure the needle's negative. Um, in some countries, notably Spain, they still have kit around that's got positive needles. And with a positive needle, you need at least four times as much current as you do with a negative needle because of the way it stimulates the nerve. Um, which is why I had trouble when I was reading Spanish papers because you know, they had thresholds of 2.5 milliamps. I think, what? <laughs> I don't even start with 2.5 milliamps. And now I realized they were using positive, positive needles. So those are the three variables you're kind of playing with with the nerve stimulator. Why would they do that? I have no idea. Historical. Um, 
when I came here, the nerve stem is we had were at least 10, 12, 15 years old. We've bought a couple of new ones since then. We got better at it. But I think you know they had kit from the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s um, that had yet to be had yet to be replaced. So energy comes with two components: strength and duration. So much current for so much time equals your energy. It's the area um, under the curve, and there are a number of ways you can stimulate a nerve. This is square wave pulse, which is what comes out of your boxes. So you've got a certain duration in milliseconds and a certain strength in terms of milliamps. And the air under the curve is the total amount of energy that you're delivering. And the physiologists have played to put this for, for many years. And what they will do is they will give you a short duration with a huge current or a longer duration with a lesser current to provide the same amount of energy to a nerve. And they'll use um, equipment to give you a strength duration curve. What they're doing is they're increasing the stimulus impulse duration while decreasing the amount of current they're giving to try and work out how much energy you need to get an action potential. And obviously you're going to get a curve that looks something like that. And all that curve is telling you is that if you actually take, you know, like a frog static nerve and put an electrode on the nerve, if you stimulate at this length of time at that amount of current, anything above here will produce an action potential. If you don't get to the purple line, you won't get an action potential. So here, in short duration, once you get to this amount of current, you've got your action potential. Um, and that's a fairly typical strength duration curve. Um, if you can reproduce this in an exam, it's going to help you explain a few things a lot easier than just trying to do it in words. So that's a standard strength duration curve. The kind of buzzwords you'll see banded about is, first of all, rear base. Have you heard the word rear base before? Okay. Um, rear base is an amount of current. And it's the amount of current you need in milliamps at infinite duration to get an action potential. Okay? If you go below the rear base current, you cannot get an action potential no matter how long you stimulate for. So what physiologists do is they start with a very low current with an infinite duration of um, impulse duration and slowly turn the current up until they just get an action potential so it just meets here. The reason that you don't get action potentials below the rear base current is the body's ability to rectify what you're trying to do with it overcomes your machine. So at very low rear base currents, the nerve stimulator can't alter the nerve voltages faster than the body can rectify the voltages back to normal. So you have to... Okay. Okay. Um, so that's what's going on here. At the rear base current, you're just managing to overcome the body's ability to rectify itself and, 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 and stop you giving it an action potential. If you now turn the current up to twice the rear base and work out what time you need to get an action potential, you'll get yourself something on the time axis. It's called the Crohn axis. Have you heard the word before? Have you come across it? Okay. So all the chronaxi means, a rear base is a current, and the chronaxi is a time in milliseconds. All that is, it's the time you need to, your impulse duration for, it's the time you need to stimulate for, um, to get an action potential if you're using twice the rear base current. The reason it's important is because this is the most efficient place to be stimulating a nerve. It's like a lot of things in life. If you're trying to work here, very tiny changes in impulse duration, you need huge changes in um, strength in terms of milliamps to get an action potential. So it becomes very clumsy. Yeah. Once you fix one thing, tiny changes in the other one make a huge difference. And similarly here, if you're stimulating at very low currents, you need quite big changes of um, impulse duration to make it work. So here and here, it's fairly clumsy to use. You can't adjust it very well. Here, 
there's a more linear relationship between strength and impulse duration, so you can, you, can, you can play with them. So for any nerve system, the ideal place to be stimulating it at is at the pronaxia in terms of impulse duration, which is why in mammalian systems with motor nerves, it's about a tenth of a millisecond. I mean, the physiologists have known this for a long time, and that's why when they design nerve stimulators, they set them up to work with an impulse duration of about 0.1 of a millisecond. So, in terms of physiology 101, if you can reproduce that graph in an exam, you can explain how a nerve stimulator works. The plot thickens a little bit because if that explains why you can use a nerve stimulator if people are awake without causing agony. Because if you put current into a patient and you're stimulating the motor and the sensory fibers at the same time, they can experience twitches and severe pain. But have you done a lot of awake blocking? How much screaming do you get in the anesthetic room? A lot? A little? Not very much? If you're doing it well, not very much. Yeah. But what's working for you is if you've picked 0.1 milliseconds as your um, impulse duration, you need that much current to get a motor response and that much current to get a sensory response. So if you pick your amount of current sensibly, having picked sensible impulse duration to start with. Mm -hmm. There's a huge separation between motor and sensory stimulation, and that's what's working for you. And that's why you don't tend to get lots of pain when you do a femoral block or a brachial plexus block in someone who's awake. If you have a bad day and don't realise or accidentally select one millisecond, now the difference is much smaller. They're much closer to each other. There's still a difference, but you're much more likely to get pain if you're using this kind of impulse duration. So by choosing the right impulse duration, you exploit this, this difference. So that's the basic guts of it. In terms of how we manipulate it, the next thing to talk about is the distance between the needle tip and the nerve. And that's because the ability of a needle to stimulate a nerve varies with the square of the distance. So it's not linear, it's, it varies with the square. And um, this is a slightly clumsy diagram, but I like it because it helps. The idea is that this needle's quite far away from this nerve, so there aren't many lines of flux going through it. Whereas this needle's very close to the nerve, and there's many more lines of flux going through it. Um, it's, it's a variation of Coulomb's. Set our impulse duration and we vary our current. We vary our current. And the distance. And the distance. And we, and we set our, and the hertz are, are set by the machine as well. Yep. Um, that graph, going back to that graph, I'm sorry to go back, yeah. go back to that graph. Yeah. If you, um, you've, <laughs> at the lower duration, you need a greater strength of current. Yeah. So for, mo for motor, what we were saying is, 